Hi ladies, lovely to be back with you uh, with our second study in Ephesians. Today we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 to 23. So if you haven't yet uh, read through the passage, won't you just press pause and have a read through the passage. So here in our passage today, <clears throat> Paul reveals to the Ephesian churches what he has been praying for them. He's providing warm assurance of his affection for them and he's explaining to them what he thinks they most need from God. It doesn't um, contain any requests for material blessings like better health or jobs or for relational blessings um, at work or for marriages or for raising children. It is a prayer for, steep, for deep spiritual blessings in knowing God. As we go into this study, we need to just remind ourselves that prayer simply means speaking to God. God speaks to us through the words of scripture and we respond to him in the words of prayer. The Bible celebrates prayer as an amazing privilege shared by the adopted children of God with the Son of God. Our Heavenly Father always listens, gives us peace when we pray, and will always do what is best for us to become like Jesus. Our prayers are like breathing. When our prayers are neglected, we soon become spiritually sick. So let's have a look at our question. Question one, what is Paul doing and why in verse 15 to 16? Well, he's giving thanks for the Ephesian church, uh, sorry, for the Ephesian Christians. He's giving thanks for their faith in God and their love for one another. Verse 15 says, um, I'm doing this for this reason. So what is the reason? It means all that he's just said in, in chapter one, verse one to 14, about God gathering his chosen, redeemed and sealed, people. That is why he is giving thanks. Paul recognizes in the reports of the Christians, um, in the reports that he's received back of these Christians' distinctive lifestyle, that they bear a telltale tell cross-shaped birthmark of God's true children. They have the vertical dimension of faith in the Lord Jesus, which trusts in his sacrificial ministry on the cross, but they also have the horizontal dimension of love for all God's people, whatever their ethnic or social background. Real Christians always demonstrate growth in both of these dimensions, faith in Christ and love for all believers. So what is revealing about Paul saying that he has not stopped doing this? Paul prayed unceasingly, regularly. Prayer was a constant feature of his life. He was usually ferociously busy and now was suffering in prison. But he still prayed for his Christian friends at all times. He could have stopped praying. He could have been too busy, too struggling. Or simply prayed for himself, for his busyness and his struggles. But he didn't. Right here, Paul is setting an example for us for our own prayers. The challenge that I want to put to you, and actually the challenge that Paul puts to you, is will you pray like this for other people? You may worry that if you're praying for other people, you won't have time to focus on praying for yourself. But I want you to understand that prayer is not like a cash machine. It's not like taking cash from a cash machine. It is about maintaining our relationship with our Heavenly Father. He will always provide fully for us, but He wants us to learn to care more about our brothers and sisters in Christ than about ourselves. Have you ever noticed that the Lord's Prayer is plural? Our Father, give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us. Paul then goes on to describe 
his prayers of request for the Ephesians. In the light of God's great plan to unite all things in heaven and on earth under Christ in order to parade his victory over Satan in the spiritual dimensions. We looked at that last week in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10. That is the plan for this world. When we learn that prayer is not about getting God to accomplish our plans, but about gladly submitting ourselves to His, we will find that when we turn His plans into our prayers, they are going to be constantly answered. Now you may struggle with the thought, the Bible teaches that God does not lie, He does not change His mind, or that God knows what you need before you ask. So then you may be saying, well, what is the point of praying at all? We need to understand that pray, prayer is not about getting God to submit to my will, but it's about submitting ourselves to His. I want you to grab a piece of paper and a pen if you don't yet have one, um, because John Colvin, he identified, he clarified six great biblical reasons for why we should pray. Firstly, to learn to depend on our Heavenly Father. Secondly, to purify the desires of our hearts. Thirdly, to be content with whatever He provides. Fourthly, to appreciate more deeply His generous faithfulness. Fifthly, to enjoy without guilt the many gifts that He provides. And sixthly, to trust Him to constantly provide for our daily needs. Is that why you pray? We don't pray to get God to fit in with our plans, but to get ourselves to fit in to His. So what should we be praying for each other? Well, Paul tells us in verse 17, he prays that they will know God better through His Spirit's work in them. The greatest blessing that anyone can experience is to know God and to know Him better every day. Paul says in Philippians 3 verse 8, he says, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. How desperately sad that we can acquire so much knowledge in our professional life. We can have so many close friends we know well, and yet we settle for knowing God only superficially. Whatever else that we may pray for other Christians, let's make sure that we pray that they and we may know God better. In verse 18, he also prays that their hearts will be more and more dominated and directed by the great hope they have in Christ. What we think about, what we think the future holds will shape how you live today. I want you also to think about it. So in, just in light of our great hope, the great hope that we have, you know, Paul is wanting our hearts to be set on that. So that is where what we value. I want you to think about, you know, if you spend a huge amount of money on something, you care for it, right? Have you ever stopped to think that God has spent an inconceivable amount on you? He bought you with the blood of Christ. You see, if we knew that, we would be freed from chasing after value the world's way or in the eyes of others. Paul prays that we would know the riches that go with our hope because this will shape how we live. And then verse 19, um, he prays that they will appreciate the immense power of God that works in them to secure them in faith and for their future. And um, we're going to pick up on this um, a little bit later on in the study and go into more detail with there. Okay, so the question three says, who will need to be at work in us if we are to know God better? So you may be sitting saying, yes, I want to know God better. How? 
Well, verse 17 tells you, it is by his spirit. If you try to get to know God any other way, you will not achieve it. The spirit of wisdom and revelation will bring a deeper understanding of God as he is revealed in his spirit's inspired word so that we can get to know him better and better. Whatever our personal or cultural background, anyone can be reconciled to God and to each other through the death of Christ as part of God's eternal plan to unite everything under Christ in the church. You need to understand that Paul is not praying that the spirit of wisdom and revelation would bring revelations from God outside of scripture. That's a danger we face in our world today. But it rather is a prayer that they will, for a deeper understanding of God as he is revealed within scripture so that you may know him better. But it is through the ministry of God's Spirit speaking through the living words of Scripture that we get to know God Himself. So if you are looking anywhere else, you will not know God. It is our supreme privilege as Christians not just to know about Him, but to know Him personally. I want you to listen up. You might need to go back and replay this section. This is what J.I. Packer says. J.I. Packer, I love him because he doesn't beat around the bush. This is what he says. We are so cruel to ourselves if we try to live in this world without knowing about the God whose world it is and who runs it. The world becomes a strange, mad, painful place and life in it a disappointing and unpleasant business for those who don't know God. He says, disregard the study of God and you sentence yourself to stumble and blunder through life blindfolded, as it were, with no sense of direction and no understanding of what surrounds you. Even us as Christians, we know that feeling, don't we? When we wander from the truth, when we stop knowing God better through his scriptures. And then he goes on to say, this way you can waste your life and lose your soul. And he says, our aim in studying the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, must be to know God himself better. Our concern must be to enlarge our acquaintance, not simply with the doctrine of God's attributes, but with the living God whose attributes they are. Wow. Like I said, you may want to go back and re-listen to that. Verses 3 to 14, why would we ever, why would we want other Christians to know God better? Well, he is our creating, ruling, electing, redeeming, sealing, glorifying God who loves us. It is wonderful to know someone who loves you. In a good marriage, one of the greatest joys is simply coming to know the other person more and more and to appreciate them more and more. God is perfect. The more we know him, the more we will know his love for us and enjoy loving him. Like we said, the, the word heart in the Bible is used not to describe the organ pumping blood around our limbs, but it is rather the center of our physical and spiritual being, combining our intellectual understanding and our personal Affection. So that's what uh, Paul has in mind when he speaks about the heart. So with this in mind, what is Paul praying for in verse 18? We've touched on this a little bit already. Paul is praying that our perspective, oh, um, so, uh, sorry, our perspective depends on our values, which are shaped by the affections of our hearts. We know that. So Paul prays that the eyes of their hearts will be enlightened by God to love the things that God loves. So that these Christians will see the world the way God sees it, which is really the way that it is. God doesn't want to alter the circumstances of our lives, but he wants to alter the way that we see those circumstances. 
by changing our hearts. We need to remind ourselves that the Apostle Paul is suffering in prison, but we don't hear him asking for prayer to be released. But rather, in chapter 6, verse 19 to 20, go look. You know what he prays for? He prays for courage to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Those around who do not know God or understand the gospel might see Paul as a defeated preacher trapped in the misery of a Roman dungeon. But with the eyes of an enlightened heart, by the eternal plans of God, Paul sees himself as a dignified ambassador of Christ, gathering others under the rule of Christ, with a wonderful opportunity to evangelize fellow prisoners and guards, and so to demonstrate in the heavenly realms that Christ is enthroned in victory over his enemies. That is quite a shift in perspective. We need to pray for each other, that the eyes of our hearts, the way that we view the world in which we live, will be enlightened by God's Spirit, through God's Word, with such a deep affection for God and the truths of His Gospel, that our situation completely changes. When we see life in this way, Paul says in chapter 1 verse 18, that we will then know the hope to which he has called you. In the gospel, God has called and summoned us into the invisible but completely certain future that the Bible describes in many different ways and in different places as our hope, our eternal life, an incorruptible righteousness, a new creation, heaven and God's glory, the kingdom of the risen Christ. Being a Christian is essentially about living a life of confident hope that is unique in this world. Chris, uh, Richard Koken suggests that in Western culture today, there is generally lots of misdirected faith and lots of superficial love, but no realistic hope for the future. This is why so many in our generation are escaping from the reality of the future that is hurtling towards them by hiding in alcohol, work, sexual excitement, entertainment, or even devotion to their family. In verse 18, Paul, who himself is in prison, writes, um, he is teaching us to pray not for our circumstances to be altered, but for our heart's view of our circumstances to be altered. Why do we find this so hard? Well, we live in a world that lives by sight and not by faith. And so do we, naturally. We tend to think that our success as people rests in how good our circumstances are. And the changing of our circumstances is what will bring us the things that we want in life, satisfaction, security, and so on. Often in how we speak to one another and pray for one another, we sometimes reinforce this to one another. Why would it be wonderful for us to be able to see life in this way? Well, if we see life in a way that always remembers that Christ is reigning on high, and that we are on our way home, then we don't need to escape our reality or seek to change our reality at any cost. We can be confident and not fearful, however great our flaws or problems are. You see, what Paul is doing is he's calling us to come back and to take stock of what we have. It's like a lot, the lottery tickets. Apparently, there is 110 million rand um, unclaimed jackpot. So the person doesn't realize that they have won this money. So the prize remains unclaimed. Do you realize that you have every spiritual blessing in Christ? Have you taken stock of that? Have you claimed that? Because it's yours. 
Do you believe this? Do you think it's what you need amidst, amidst your pressing needs? You may even right now still be thinking about how useful that lottery money could be to you right now. Ladies, we have to grasp all we have, all our blessings in Christ, otherwise they remain unclaimed. So we need to pray that the Spirit would cause our hearts to know how much we have. And then at the end of verse 18, we might expect Paul to say, the riches of our glorious inheritance in heaven. But what does Paul say, and why is it surprising? Well, the extravagantly abundant wealth of the glorious inheritance that God has prepared for himself to enjoy in eternity is us. Isn't that staggering? God Almighty, who could provide anything he wanted, for his enjoyment in eternity has chosen to enjoy forever with saved and sanctified sinners like us. God's love is so extraordinary, merciful and generous that he has invited people like you and me who once were the enemies of his son to spend eternity with Jesus in paradise. That is breathtaking forgiveness and incredible hospitality. God has planned that we are his inheritance forever. However hard your life is currently, can your heart see how magnificent this will be? Richard Cogan tells a story that um, one of the reasons he loves to go and visit his in-laws is because of this overwhelming sense that when they walk in the door, they have been massively look at, been looking forward to their being there. So much has been carefully planned. Vast amount of food have been cooked. Expensive wines have been opened and lined up on the dresser ready for the meal. And gifts of cakes and jars of marmalade have been prepared for them to take home. It's lovely to feel so welcome. Unbelievably, God has been preparing for our arrival for eternity past because we are his glorious inheritance. Then, um, coming back to verse 19, what else does Paul want the hearts of the Ephesian Christians to know? He wants them to know God's incomparably great power for believers. We know that God has incomparably great power. We just need to look up at the galaxies that he's made to decorate our ceiling, as it were. All his awesome power will be made available to accomplish his amazing plan to bring us together under Christ in heaven forever. So how should verse 20 excite us about the kind of power that is at work in us and for us? Did you see that the power that is in you is the same power that was great enough to raise Jesus from the dead and then seat him at the right hand in the heavenly realm, right hand of God in the heavenly realms. That same power is now used to keep us going in faith and will be used to raise us too. We could almost say that God practiced resurrecting us in resurrecting Jesus. He's done it before, so we can trust and we can know that he can do it again. How does Paul assure us in verse 21 to 23 that nothing can stop us being his inheritance? Well, we're told that our Savior is enthroned above all powers, all evil powers, above every position imaginable. No one can get remotely close to taking us away from our Savior. And we're told in verse 22 that he rules for us for the benefit of the church. However small our churches are, or however vulnerable you feel, all God's resurrection power is being used to keep us and keep the church trusting Christ. There is no one more powerful than our Lord. Verse 23 tells us that Christ cares so much for the church. Why? Because the church is his body. 
God is intensely present in each believer and in every church to bless us with his salvation, his holiness and his gifts because each is incredibly precious to God. That's you. Christ who died to save his body now lives to serve his body. All God's resurrection power is being employed to gather churches together, believers, you and me, and then to keep churches trusting Christ until they physically arrive to join the great heavenly gathering around the throne of Christ. Ladies, in closing, don't just pray for your Christian friends to know earthly peace and prosperity, health and happiness. Pray for them. Pray for yourself to experience the huge spiritual privileges of knowing God better, of knowing the hope to which he has called us, and of knowing the power which he has committed to bringing us home to be with him. The next time that you are tempted not to pray or to think that you don't know what to pray for, we can now employ these verses in confidence that this is the kind of prayer that others need and our Heavenly Father answers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you blown away by the knowledge of who you are and what you've done for us. We ask, Lord, that as a result of this passage, we would desire and prioritize knowing you better. We pray that you would daily fill our hearts with the assurance of all that awaits us because we are your children. And may this hope of the future shape what we value and how we live here on earth. We ask that you would help us to grasp your power that so powerfully is at work in us. We ask, Lord, that we would be women who pray these things, not only for ourselves, but our sisters in Christ, that we know also need these assurances. And we ask this in your name. Amen.